Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Josna Harris, and I'd like to welcome you here. Um, I will be moderating our workshop today, which is called Dismantling the Old and Shifting the Narrative. And I'm joining you from my home in Minnesota, and um, that is located on the traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of the Dakota and the Anishinaabe people. We'd love to hear from you, um, so if you could type in the chat where you are joining from today, please introduce yourself, and if you know the native land that you are on, if you could please include that too. So go ahead now and take a moment to introduce yourself. And again, my name is Josna, and I'm with Climate Generation, a Will Steger legacy. And one of my favorite aspects of what I do is listening to other people's stories. Um, but to begin today, I'm just going to share a little bit with you about who I am. I am first generation American, and my dad came to Minnesota in the early 1960s. You'll see a picture of my dad on the screen there. Um, and I'm the little one on the right of my dad, along with my sister. Um, so my dad came to Minnesota in the 1960s um, to work for a company called 3M. And it was part of his American dream. And in those early days, he would write letters back to our family in India and he would share stories, um, what seemed like tall tales of our Minnesota winters here. And growing up, we would go um, and go back and visit my family in India. And growing up here in Minnesota, it really felt like I was part of two very different worlds that were in stark contrast to each other. But the world is a different place uh, than it was 30 years ago. And the imprint of climate change is really all around us from the extreme heat and water shortages that my family has experienced in India to our warming winters here in Minnesota that are affecting our ecosystems, health, economy, and traditions. And this global climate crisis that we are all facing, especially in this time of pandemic, has really uh, made me realize that the world is not as big as it sometimes feels and that our stories are not disconnected from each other. So thanks for listening to just a little bit about me. Um, I'd like to thank you for joining us here for our second workshop in our Eyewitness Virtual Series, Dismantling the Old and Shifting the Narrative. And what we'll share today will actually build on our first workshop, um, which was called The Critical Intersection of Climate Change and Racial Injustice. But if you missed that, you can still catch the replay. And we're gonna share a link with you at the very end of this workshop if you'd like to do that. Um, we also have a last workshop in this series, which is following this one on September 22nd, and that is called Rebuilding the New, Another World is Possible. And you will not want to miss it because we are going to be talking all about our stories of resilience and solutions. And I know we probably all need a little bit of optimism, especially as we're going into this um, election this fall. Um, and this virtual series is actually in celebration of a book um, which shares the firsthand accounts of people from all over the state of Minnesota and their experiences of climate change through stories, poems, and art. So if you'd like to learn more about the book and this series, you can click on the button that's at the bottom of your screen that says Explore Eyewitness. Essentially, Eyewitness is a demonstration of literary activism. It's our testimony of climate change. And we are excited to share that Climate Generation will be delivering copies of the Eyewitness book to every Minnesota legislator, legislator in 2021, along with constituent letters from you. So um, stay tuned because later on, we are gonna be sharing with you a way that you can use your voice to demand climate justice from your legislator, no matter where you live. 
Um, to tell you a little bit more about who we are, uh, Climate Generation, a Will Steger legacy, is a nonprofit and we are completely dedicated to climate change. Um, our mission is to empower individuals and their communities to engage in solutions to climate change. So we're super glad that you took the time today to be here with us. Right now in our world, we know that we are facing um, overlapping crises, climate change, racial injustice, COVID-19, and all of these have very clearly demonstrated that we have um, injustice in our systems and that they are very connected to each other. In the first workshop, we explored some of the ways that climate change and racial injustice are interconnected. And essentially, climate justice is racial justice. And we cannot effectively address one without addressing the other. Climate change and racial injustice are built and are being perpetuated by the same economic and political structures, systems, and policies. And we know that really there are opportunities before all of us to think about dismantling the systems that really don't work for everybody and to reimagine ways to do things better. Research tells us that sharing our stories of climate change can help to influence social norms, and it can also help us build the public will that we need to advance solutions to climate change. And while our stories are our individual perspectives, when we share them, it's really the collective of our voices that can shift the dominant narrative. And so we're excited to do some of that with you today. We also know that the upcoming election will set the course for how these overlapping crises are addressed in our country. And we know that every vote will count. So we want to make sure that you are registered if you are eligible to vote and to know where to do that. So we are pasting a link in the chat if you'd like to know more about how to do that. And today we are really honored to share this space with three incredible guests. Aaron Sharkey, Strong Buffalo, and Ben Weaver. And while we won't be able to really talk about or hit on every system in our society that is broken, um, we will be able to touch on a few aspects uh, that our guests will be sharing. And um, as you listen, we want you to know that there will be something that is required of you too. Throughout the workshop, we are going to be posing live action opportunities so that you can take action with us. So we invite you to listen and learn, but we also want you to not get too comfortable and to lean into the role that your voice can play in demanding justice. Um, and with that, we're going to practice. So we have our first action opportunity, and we've created a petition that is urging our legislators to take action on climate justice. So you can find the petition by clicking the button at the bottom of your screen, and then we're also going to paste it in the chat. Um, what we want to do with this petition is really raise our voices together to call on our legislators to advance deep and transformative solutions that make it clear that racial justice and climate justice are inseparable. So, and if you're not from Minnesota, you are welcome to make a copy of this petition and send it to your legislator too. So we are going to give you a minute right now to go ahead and sign this petition.
And know that if you didn't get to finish signing, um, you can save this URL and it will be available after the workshop too. So you can um, add your signature and we're gonna compile all of these signatures and send them to legislators in bulk after our September workshop. And now I'm super excited to introduce to you our first guest, Erin Sharkey. Um, and I just want to invite you as you are listening to each of the guests today, um, we can use the chat as a way to show um, support and encouragement. So you can paste a word of welcome or encouragement or use the emoji icons to just so show support to the speakers. And if at any time you agree with what is being said um, or you want to show reciprocity, go ahead and just type in the chat and show your support there. So um, with that, I would love for you to begin giving Erin Sharkey a warm welcome as I introduce Erin. Erin uh, is a writer, artistic organizer and cultural producer and is a co-founder with Wanda Petrus of an experimental arts production collective called Free Black Dirt. Erin was a Bell Museum resident artist, Loft Mentor Series mentee, Vona Fellow, Jerome Travel and Study grantee, Minnesota State Arts Board grantee, MRAC Next Step Fund grantee, and Givens Foundation Fellow. Erin also teaches at Metro State University and with the Minnesota Prison Writers Workshop. Welcome, Erin. I'm going to continue to um, introduce you, but it's so good to see you. Yeah, um, thanks so much. And um, currently, Erin is working in concert with other Black organizers to respond to COVID-19 and to lead in this moment of uprising. We're also super um, grateful that Erin was able to participate on the selection committee for the Eyewitness Book Project and really help to curate that collection. Um, and today, Erin is going to be sharing a little bit from her forthcoming book called A Darker Wilderness, uh, an anthology of Black nature writing. And so um, Erin will invite you to, to think about the politics of nature and ways to reclaim our relationships to it. With that, welcome, Erin. It's so good to see you. Yeah, you as well. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I'm excited to talk about the politics of space and to think about, um, yeah, how we can think about where our stories come from and think about how we can rewrite them or reconsider them. So um, I invite you as I talk to consider the intersection of climate change and nature writing. And I've been really thinking about nature writing in new ways over the last year or so. Um, yeah, and I would love to invite you to do the same. Um, so first things first, I'd love for you to take a moment and to capture in your mind a picture of what an environmentalist looks like or what a f f person who's concerned with climate justice looks like. So think for just a second about what that, that person looks like or the group of people look like. And I would argue that the image of the the people that are concerned about nature is not there by mistake. Uh, image, um, um, and, I, and I would venture to guess um, that it might be someone who um, has experienced affluence, who is maybe a white person, who's maybe um, been the person who's been really centered in these conversations about climate change. But that person is also centered when it comes to nature writing. Um, and I think it's important to acknowledge power and privilege as we enter these conversations so we, we know, um, yeah, what the fight really is. Um, so to con consider who is um, bearing the brunt of the challenges of climate change, who's benefiting from the kinds of development that we experience under the systems that we're living under, 
who's suffering the consequences of the warming planet. So I think both um, the folks that are most marginalized um, deal with the, con the consequences of a warming climate. We've, we've learned that from other speakers, those of, uh, those of you that were here for the last talk um, learned about that as well. So before I talk about my project, uh, I just want you to consider to think about the politics of place, the ways that a place holds um, the intersections of identity, of access and privilege, when we think about borders and who can cross and, and how they cross, um, who owns land, can let, you know, how, how does land ownership, um, how does it pass between generations? I think about abilities um, within bodies, um, think about the ways that land and it's um, has shaped the identity of people over time. Um, think about who experiences safety and who doesn't. In, in certain spaces. So um, I've been uh, working on this project, the uh, Darker Wilderness and Anthology of Black Nature Writing now for about a year. Um, and I have lots of natural experiences that, um, that inspired me in the project, but one of the experiences that really allowed the project to bloom um, was a class that I taught um, for Minnesota Prison Writing Workshop at Faribault Correctional um, it was a 15 week nature writing class. Um, and I had taught lots of classes, lots of classes in, um, you know, uh, nonfiction writing and memoir and lyric essay. This is the first class I had taught um, around a specific topic around nature. And I wasn't sure what to expect. Uh, I arrived uh, the first day of class and a fox ran across the path as I walked to the, the education building and I thought, this might work, <laughs> this might be okay. Um, and I really um, saw how uh, students were able to embrace um, nature as a subject matter to talk about their life experience. And they had all different kinds of experiences um, from experiences uh, growing up in a city to growing up on a farm, folks that had experienced um, war uh, overseas, folks that had um, memories of natural wonders and memories of um, natural spaces and natural systems that um, they did not feel attuned with, um, in tune with. Um, and so I started thinking about how nature actually persists um, the bounds of institutions, right? And it is, we have seen that folks of color often are in positions of stewardship of nature. And so that became the real root of the project. Um, and I started to think about um, the other work that I've been doing in archival um, investigation also has to do um, with nature. So I wanted to show you some pictures just because they're fun. Um, let me share my screen so you can see some things. Um, here it is. All right. So um, I was given the opportunity to um, spend some time in the Givens collection at the Anderson Library at the University of Minnesota through um, a residency with Coffee House Press. And it's called Coffee House Press and Stacks. Um, and I was most fascinated by a group of, um, of collection of um, narratives um, from the Federal Works of Progress Administration um, that were taken in the 30s. Um, by a writer living in um, rural Mississippi, near where my family's um, homestead is. And um, these first person narratives um, describe the experience of folks who had been enslaved, and they're called the ex-slave narratives. And I um, was fascinated by how the collection of narratives, all of them touched on a relationship to food and the garden. And I started to think about how um, the experience of violence and its horrors was also paired sometimes with an experience of autonomy and pride and craftsmanship and stewardship that comes in the garden. That folks who were enslaved dealt with a whole myriad of violences, but also a space where they could cultivate and be in relationship with nature. Um, and so that really was a root for me in this project. Um, I started thinking about the ways that farmers almanacs are in conversation um, with uh, with the natural space and the movements of the stars and the ways that folks 
um, farm and experience um, gardening. So I am particularly am interested in Benjamin Banneker, who was a almanac writer, and um, and there and described uh, in his almanacs lots of exciting things that were also reflected in these narratives. I'm sorry, not him in particular, but other um, farmers almanacs authors had written about natural phenomena that were um, also described in these narratives um, that I was finding um, in the archive. Um, so that was really the inspiration for the project paired with this class. Um, and I started to think about where do our stories come from? Where do the narratives around um, nature come from? And so I started to think about the 18th century and the ways that um, nature writing is really rooted in a chronic, in a like categorization of animals and birds and insects. That's really where it started is folks telling their personal stories of going out to categorize things. And that really was a colonial project, right? It really had to do with empire, had to do with like conquering spaces that were unfamiliar. And that's really at the heart of what nature writing is about. It has been about, um, or at least its beginning. So it's about discovery, but also about taming something or conquering something that is unfamiliar. Um, I think about the fact that there are these uh, very blurry lines between the natural history and um, sort of like beginnings of anthropological, like ethnographical um, energies and natural history museums in our country. Um, I know that um, in my research finding that there were still the human remains of 22 Inuit um, in the collection at the Field Museum not like 10 years ago were still there. Um, and that's not a unique case. So thinking about how um, the ways that we start to, to create stories around what is nature, what does it mean in, to us and our relationships has really started in that um, colonial project. Um, and I started to think about who are the people that told us these stories. So one of those sort of godfathers of na nature writing um, was Henry David Thoreau. And I read Walden's Pound in high school. I read it again in college. Um, and it wasn't until this project where I really understood the place that that um, text really sits at in, um, in terms of, of the sort of body of literature that has to do with nature. Um, I didn't know that, um, I think I have a picture of Walden's Pond, let's see. Um, I do, let me share my screen one more time so you can see it. Um, so uh, Henry David Thoreau actually um, started this project. It was sort of like, if you thought about like, if you think about like a, um, an installation arts project, um, he really was doing performance art in this piece. He really wanted to think about what it would mean to live somewhere um, by himself um, in relationship to nature for two years and two months and two days. Um, he embarked on this project after being um, released from prison, um, for ja from jail. He was um, incarcerated for not paying taxes as a protest to slavery and to the Mexican-American War. Um, his debt was paid by a family member so that he could be come out and do this project. Um, he built his cabin on the land of a buddy, um, his good friend, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Um, this reflects his privilege, right? It reflects the ways that he was able to navigate um, nature and to navigate his project of reflection uh, in nature with his privilege, right? And then we have um, other, you know, we think about, I know for me, um, Silent Spring was a really important seminal text for me in understanding um, environmentalism and um, the changing world, right? Um, it also reflects its own kind of privileges, right? Its own kind of um, narratives around uh, gender and strength and fragility, other things, spiritual nature of, of nature, the spiritual nature of nature. Um, and so I think these are all important for us to think about when we're thinking about um, who and, um, and what is nature and our relationships to it. Um, so I want you to think back to your image that you had in your head at the beginning around who is nature for, who, who are the environmentalists, right? And to remember that this is, nature writing is not neutral. And we have to, I think, um, 
take take care of that our our imagination around nature and who it's for in order to really do this work and really to engage in it and for it to be something that we all are in together and live together so um nature writing is not neutral uh climate change is not neutral um climate change is experienced by um who folks who the same folks that experience the real brunt uh especially in this country of um the ways the state has aimed to separate black folks and people of color from natural spaces. Um, so uh, take a moment as I move into the next part of my slides to think about um, where where your personal experiences or narratives were shaped. Um, what stories shaped your relationship to stewardship of nature and environmentalism? Remembering that nature writing is part of the American experiment. It's about independence and innovation and Western expansion and all the things that come with that. But remembering also that it has to do with slavery, who stewarded land, who was able to have ownership of land. Think about Jim Crow and the way that Jim Crow um, created safe spaces and, and lots and lots and lots of unsafe spaces for black folks in this country in terms of navigating spaces right so how did um folks engage in road trips they <laughs> time and times that other people were exploring and um patroning uh the national park system that sort of thing think about redlining and the ways that um certain neighborhoods were destined for certain kinds of disinvestment and blight and toxic waste and waste management facilities and industrial use, and that there is a myriad of environmental and health consequences um, that come from redlining and those sort of activities of segregation. Um, I was born in a Rust Belt city myself, and I um, came into the world wheezing. Um, I've been an asthmatic my whole life, um, and I knew it uh, in one way growing up here in Minnesota, and then I knew it in a new way when I moved. I, I was born in Milwaukee, lived in Minneapolis, and then I moved to Buffalo, New York. Um, and I learned a new thing about the ways in which industry um, really affects uh, our experience of the environment and of climate. Um, and so I lived in the west side of the city of Buffalo and lived and worked on an urban farm, an urban farm that we were able to install in a vacant lot that was uh, vacated because um, because of the failure of, of industry there or the abandonment of industry to the community that had built it. Um, and so I also experienced, um, like many, many Western New Yorkers, um, the asthma effects because of the trucks that sit for hours and hours and hours a day idling on the peace bridge between um, Buffalo and Fort Erie, Ontario and um, really spill um, diesel fuel fumes over the neighborhood. And then as the city warms, especially over the summer and especially under these conditions with climate change, um, just create a really um, poisonous mixture for folks. Um, I didn't learn about lupus until I moved to Buffalo and lupus is also, um, and then has environmental effects. Right? It came, comes from um, a lot of the kids that I worked with had lupus in them, their families that came from a super fun site um, and the in the results of industry. Um, Buffalo's vacancy and the reasons that we were able to have a farm there were um, because of the abandonment of General Motors and of Bethlehem Steel and lots of other companies that came in and, and left waste and then left town. Um, I wanted to think too about the ways that um, that uh, environmental issues and climate issues are not um, isolated to um, to just like big open natural spaces, but the city as well. Um, so I had the privilege of working at a program called Growing Green on the west side of Buffalo. And we developed an urban farm, an urban gardening program. These are some of the kids that I worked with. Um, and it felt like a brand new thing. It felt like a new opportunity. And um, then I learned that um, young people had been stewarding um, gardening and agricultural work for many, many, many generations. Um, we were doing aquaponics and growing organic produce and creating value-added products. 
um, I went into the archive um, in that initial project and learned about the ways that homemakers clubs and garden clubs um, dating back to the turn of the last century um, really uh, showed the stewardship of black folks in nature, thinking about other kinds of community gardens, gardens in the 80s. Love these tall socks. Um, so yeah, I, um, I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. So I wanna leave you just with those pictures and images, right? Those ideas of how this is not a new thing and that um, it has affected people over time. Um, climate change uh, has to do with unequal protections, has to do with unequal burdens, unequal experiences, unequal effects of the consequences of the kinds of development that we have all of us um, engaged in. Um, it's about what we can see, but also what we send down the river for someone else to deal with. Um, it's about the stories we know and the stories that we don't know. Um, and so I ask you to think about the stories that you do know, stories about um, who does nature belong to, um, who is its steward, who is um, deserves to experience um, the beauty of it, and then who um, whose stories are you not hearing and knowing about. Um, I'm gonna, I think that's my time. <laughs> I don't wanna go over, um, but I wanna um, pitch back to, to y'all. Um, for the next piece. Well, thank you so much, Erin. I feel grateful and full with just the richness of um, knowledge and wisdom that you have shared with us. I know I'm going to be taking away all of the many different questions that you posed and taking some time to think about them for myself. Thank you so, thank much. so much. All right, see ya. So I'm sure, like me, you were probably um, thinking a lot about the questions that Erin asked. Um, you know, who does nature belong to? Who are the environmentalists? Where do our stories begin? And we actually want you to think about that a little bit further. So we're going to invite you into our next action opportunity to think about um, some of these things. So we're going to put a question on the screen. Um, and we'd love for you to take a moment um, to reflect on this. What are the ways that you would like to strengthen or reimagine your relationship with nature? And um, later on, we are going to have a letter writing opportunity to send to your legislator. So you, you can potentially even use these reflections to inform what you include in your letter. So if you want to go ahead and um, think about it, you may want to grab a piece of paper or a notebook and just take a couple notes about your, your thoughts on this. So again, what are ways that you would like to strengthen or reimagine your relationship with nature? So go ahead and take about a minute now um, to do that.
So we know that that was not very much time at all to think about this question. Um, and we'd like to, you to continue to think about it. But right now we're going to ask you to take it kind of to the next level and to share um, your thoughts on social media so that we can start to influence some of those social norms with our own stories. So we have a sample prompt and we'd like to just invite you to participate in a live tweet up. Um, if you're kind of looking for what to write, there's a suggested language on the street screen that you can use. It's also in the chat if you just want to copy it and paste it into Twitter. Um, and there's some tags at the bottom. So we're going to take two minutes for you to take this action. course you can continue to do that um, but I'm really excited to introduce to you our next guests Strong Buffalo and Ben Weaver and they often will work together to collaborate to create beautiful compilations um, that I'm a fan of I love how they really invite people into a process that um, prompts imagination and um, possibility and Climate Generation has had the opportunity to collaborate with Strong Buffalo and Ben Weaver on several occasions, um, offering climate grief and storytelling workshops in the community. And it has been a joy to work with both of them. Um, as I introduce each of them, would love again for you to just post a word of encouragement, welcome, or some love in the chat. Um, so Tatanka Ohitika, Strong Buffalo, is a Dakota elder, poet, and musician. And he is an enrolled member of the Sisseton Wapitan Dakota and a decorated Vietnam veteran. He has been writing poetry before there was anything called native poetry and really starting last century. His words have been translated in more than 17 languages, three published books, six CDs, lectures, and performances, which contribute to a world that uses creativity and options other than war, racism, classism, and exploitation to solve the problems that we all share just by being alive. And Ben Weaver um, is a songwriter and poet who travels by bicycle. He uses his music as a tool to strengthen relationships between people and their local ecosystems and Ben's most recent project, Music for Free, saw him riding 3,000 miles from Canada to Mexico along the Great Divide mountain bike route, um, where he carried his guitar and banjo, making stops along his route, 
to offer free performances to really honor unification through diversity. Um, ben has completed many wilderness music by bike tours, released nine studio albums and five books of poetry. And given the choice, he will side with the animals, lakes, rivers, and trees. Um, with that, I'd like to welcome both of you. Welcome, Strong Buffalo. Welcome, Ben. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Um, OK, I'm going to start. Um, thanks for having us. And Aaron, thanks for all of your thoughts. Um, I'm going to sing a couple of songs. And I wanted to just say one thing that came to my mind while I was listening earlier. Um, for me, I've spent a lot of time traveling on my bicycle, um, being very fortunate to do that in places outside the city. And then when I come back to the city, um, feeling this yearning to be connected to the land in a way that I felt when I wasn't in the city. And it's, it took me a long time to realize that the same wisdom that was sitting in these far away, untouched places, so to speak, was also sitting at the end of my block um, or in other nooks and crannies around the city or in the sidewalk cracks. And, and I started realizing that also the way that we um, have divided our cities and the way that we tend to the green spaces in our cities correlate to like how we, how we treat bodies and how we treat people. And, um, and understanding that inside of wildness and inside of humanity, there is some correlation there and um, that it's more difficult to find when we've been taught that pristineness is part of nature and that beauty and like national parks and this sort of consumptive aspect of, of beauty is what nature is. But it's also the purse lane and the sidewalk cracks and it's also the buckthorn and it's also all the unintended parts in the city. Um, and, and whether they're quote unquote beautiful or not, the wisdom of wildness is still in all of those spaces and it's inside of all of us as human beings. And that's where our point of connection, I think, can be. So um, this is a song that I wrote when I was uh, in the middle of nowhere. One day I'll disappear into the lightning. Ride the river through the night Using my hands in the water Pulling diamonds from the dark You see today could be a wild pony Even if the wind never goes away Where the rapids toss the timber And the rain is pushing at my jaw I find my heart in the open spaces where I once saw a beast slip through the fold. I find my heart in the open spaces where closer I always want to be. And closer I always long. Pine needles in my water, and the tall trees at my back. I'm drawn away from the trodden places, I'm always doubling my tracks. But even left with empty pockets, you can find an agate anywhere. The upper stretches of the river. The upper stretches of our dreams. I find my heart in the open spaces near the fork of a creek at the foot of a hill. I find my heart in the open spaces where closer I always long to be. Closer I always. I was going to share one, one poem here called uh, Rain on the Seas. 
Which stone will be first? When things come apart, which river will sweep up the dragonfly's invisible heart? Which caterpillar will become which butterfly? And what will the weasel with the wind at the tip of their tongue dream before dumping out a basket full of diamonds into the morning, their red cheeks streaked with lightning mud and claw marks? What will that one damn dog who unraveled everything think while overhearing the humans laughing out on the porch, carrying joy among the grasses? What will finally lead the divided to find wasps in the wood sorrel, experiencing with awe the bees who draw bouquets of flowers below the skyscrapers, distributing pollen through these perilous times? Who will set right the discrepancies between what was written and what has been lived? Haven't we always felt the things we are made of? Haven't the things we are made of always felt us? How could any one piece be separated when there is only braided mutual metabolisms? How could any one piece be separated when there is only woven and constant transformation? How could any one piece be separated when there is only entwined relationship? When there is no alone, how could there be anything other than alive? We often refer to it, you know, the spot. I'll meet you there. When will you go there again? When were you there last? I'm at that spot now. We all know it. We all share it. We all love it. Others love it too. But it's our spot. That very special place. But we take it for granted. Yet others are running away from violence, avoiding difficult times. Enduring losses to get there, going through separations with dangers and fears, just for that spot. It's in our lives, inside our minds, deep inside our hearts. It's a part of our souls. Where no borders should be. No one should be lost or separated by paper, by laws, and by ways that deny that spot. That place should be open, free for all, to that beautiful spot that lives will always be the treasure of our dream. So, come all, come here to the home of the American Indians for over 500 years. It's been the refuge of the world's refugees. Why stop now? Don't let hate stop the dreams. There's enough space for you to make a home. There's enough so no one has to go without. Come, be the way you want. Come and be yourself. God gave this homeland to us to share. There's no walls around our homes. No one is better or worse. Come and care. Come and share. This land, this home, is for us all. So come all to that spot. Right here, right now. It's in me, it's in you. Over there and here. That is that spot. It has been given to us by God. It has been given to us by God. It's God's place. It's God's spot. 
So I got a little, a little short poem I wrote today. I'd like to say that, you know, as human beings, we think we're not part of nature, you know, that it's another entity and commodity or something, but we're part of it. We're one with nature. Two legged are animals and a part of the world. And in climate change, it's real. And we're the change in the climate. That's why it's changing it's us human beings. This is a little one, I don't have a title for it. Sometimes I can't tell what's talking. Is it my head, my heart, or somebody else? Confusion ripples through the soft waves and the cool breezes. Peace, just the time when to do is doing what it is supposed to do, when it is supposed to. I think we should all marry the earth. Who's gonna pay for that? We should start adopting forgotten groves of trees or lonely mountain ranges or that duck on that pond or that poor fish in that dirty water, that beaver chewing on oily bark. Name it and ourselves the same, sister lake, brother birch, so that the love becomes equal we love you, I hear. Who said that? As some flowers shimmer in my garden that I call Alice. Who cares who said that? We should love each other, for we are all the family of the living. Good, said God. I'd like to thank uh, Climate Generation for inviting us and uh, this one uh, Ben and I did we do wild buffalo rides and we went this one down Hidden Falls by Fort Snelling and this one I wrote after it's called Hidden Falls <laughs> Has ended before. Four times it has died before now. By fire, floods, cold and dry. And the fourth world, it was to have lasted forever. Evermore. But now, all four legs of the buffalo are gone. And we all have gone too far. We all need to talk. To talk about it all. Make the changes needed. The only thing different in this world is that we're in it. Make your spirit stronger. Make life last longer. Make us one and all. Or directions change. Time before now and then. Stand tall with Mother Earth Child. Stand tall with Mother Earth Child. Thank you. Thank you so much, John Buffalo. Thank you, Ben Weaver. I mean, we, I just really thank you for bringing grounding into this moment. And I, I feel like you always so powerfully lead with intuition for what the moment needs. And I really appreciate that just 
really helped to deepen all of what Aaron shared in such a powerful way and is going to help me to be able to think of some of those big questions about who is nature for and whose stories are, are missing from it. And so thank you for all of your work and um, the beauty that you're bringing in the world. Thank you. Uh, well, I know that this is just, um, you know, as we shift really whose stories are being told in this moment, the beginning, part of the beginning is having this conversation and being willing to have it. And so I thank you all for being here with us. And I think it's one of the many conversations that we could actually have. So I'm glad that we could take some time today to talk about, um, hear from Aaron, to hear about the politics of nature and to talk about the, some, some of the things that we don't often get to talk about. We are nearing the end of our time and there are a few other um, important things that we wanted to invite you into. One is that um, we do have an opportunity for you to write a letter to your legislator and we wanna make it easy for you. So we have created a fill in the blank style letter template that you can personalize with your own climate story. And because Eyewitness is really a demonstration of literary activism, um, we want you to use your voice. So this is gonna require a little bit more time. So go ahead and save this URL. We're also gonna post it in the chat. Um, and then you can come back to it later, but we'd love for you at some point in the near future to finish your letter because we will be collecting them and delivering them along with copies of the eyewitness book to the Minnesota policymakers in 2021. Um, so make sure to save this link and then come back and complete it. Um, and in closing, I just wanna say a generous thank you to all of our guests today who so powerfully and um, vulnerably shared with us. Uh, Aaron Sharkey, Strong Buffalo, and Ben Weaver, we are grateful to you. I also wanna thank everybody that was able to just take time out of their schedule and share some space with us today to have this conversation and um, for all of the actions that you were willing to take with us. Just a quick recap on the screen, you can see um, some of the things that we invited you to do. You can sign a petition to your uh, legislators. You had an opportunity to share your own voice um, and your climate story on social media. And then we'd love for you to write your letter um, to your legislator and we will deliver it for you. Um, and then of course, we don't want you to stop there. This is just like what we can do right now in this moment. Um, but this is going to take all of us and it's going to take commitment to the long haul work that is going to be required. And of course, voting is going to be super important. And if you want to learn more about how you can use your vote for climate justice, you can join us on September 10th for a separate webinar that's going to share all of the essentials that you will need to know to stay informed in this election. And then finally, we um, want to hear from you. So if you could take a moment in the chat to just share, how are you leaving this experience today? What inspired you? Um, so post in the chat um, right now about how you are leaving this experience and going out into the world. I know that after this, I'm really craving to get outside and be in nature. And I have a lovely garden that I'm going to be spending time inside. Um, so I invite you to find ways that can ground you and connect you with nature as well. And then finally, in our closing slides, we're gonna be sharing some information about how you can follow each of our awesome guests and um, information on how you can plug into the next workshop in this series, which is on September 22nd. And again, that one is all about um, resilience and climate solutions. And then how you can order a copy of the eyewitness book. And in closing, we're also gonna play you out with a song by Ben Weaver called Downstream from his album called Seas Like a River. So thank you so much everybody for joining us. Stay well and be blessed. Mm -hmm.